There are a couple of keys uh, in this approach. Because we have a big program, we have sections going on in, in Masri and Shami. Both of these are available. Uh, please don't try to do both in the same class. Please don't try to do both Masri and Shami. Pick one. Stick to it. It does not matter if your colleague who is teaching them next semester or next year does another dialect. This has gone on for several years in our campus. Students, actually, we had somebody write an MA thesis on this last spring. Um, and interviews with the students sort of say, OK, yeah, it's confusing at times, and I get mixed up, and I have to learn a few extra words. But, but I know that it allows me to deal with the real world and to deal with speakers from different countries. And I know my Arabic is enriched because of this. So they're on board. Um, the key for us is that, as an instructor, if I have a student in my class whose perhaps former teacher has done the shami, and I'm going to be teaching the Masri version, the Masri version, the Egyptian version, is what I'm going to ask them to do as homework. It's what we're going to present in class. They have to understand it. But I'm not going to force that student to change her or his dialect from Shami to Masri. That student will continue to speak Shami. That Shami dialect will be that student's dialect identity, and that goes forward. And, and students have no problem. Everybody understands each other, uh, and, and you know it's not an issue. Comprehension, then, is at a very different level of, from production in this, in this multi-variant world that we live in. Much as it is for all of us in the United States, which is not a local dialect environment, we all deal with each other speaking different dialects all the time. We negotiate. We learn a few new words. Uh, and and, and we get to, uh, we, our ears get familiar with different pronunciations. And students do the same thing. Just as we do, they do. They see us doing it. Uh, it's not an issue. They appreciate the richness, as I said, that it brings in. So. A lot of comprehension and then production has to be much more level appropriate for the students. Focus on the important things. Masculine feminine agreement, conjugating the verbs right. You know, there are things that, that students really need to be focusing on, not whether they're saying uh, the correct Egyptian word for X and such. Uh, which brings me to my second point, which is that we, we don't want to think in, in terms of very local dialect forms, right? We want to think in terms of the kind of language that we speak in when we're speaking to somebody from a different, from maybe a different dialect family. We don't speak in very local forms. We are not in Cairo. We are not in Beirut. We are not in Damascus. We are not in Fez. We're in the U.S. We're speaking cross-dialectically. That's a level of language that is clearly not Fosha, but this is kind of the level that I think we should aim at uh, in our classes um, and with our students. And I will stop there. I'll give Mahmoud a chance to add a few things. Good morning. Uh, just to, a few things to add here about the vision, this vision of Arabic. I mean, so far we have been living in this dichotomy word of Fusha and Ammi. And as Kristen said, students have been concerned with the differences because when we teach them three years of modern standard Arabic and then we go into Ammi, it's, the focus is on how are they different. And this is the... This new vision that we are trying to bring here is like one Arabic. This is one language system. We are dealing with the different varieties based on the functions. So our interest here is not which variety, and this is Fusha, based on the functions. In, in, in real life, when you introduce yourself, when you find someone, when you are asking, you are ordering a meal, you do that in a dialect. You don't do that in... Uh, so what... In, in terms of, of, we do understand that the teachers, we as teachers, we need to retool ourselves. We have been set in a certain way, and this is not easy. And sometimes we talk about, we say students are confused. From my experience, I see the teachers are more confused than the students here. And this is why we need to retrain ourselves and to have expectations. So basically, as, as teachers, we need to develop this vision. And this is part of the vision that we have. So what do we expect from the students in the very beginning? It's when we start introducing these uh, uh, colloquial forms. And, and these forms, I mean, the, 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 because when the students, when they see in the book, they see the Fusha forms and the Ammi. And as Kristen said, we should not do both, so basically one. So my approach when I teach first year, my approach to the students is say, okay, when you study, I want you to study the column that is in, in Fusha. 
and then the dialect, and the dialect I usually teach is the Shami. I say, okay, you study both of them. I want you to choose one that is your active form. I don't want you to feel that you have to learn two words at the same time. Okay, we are learning the pronouns. Okay, what are you going to learn? Hum or hinni? Okay, you make the choice. That is your choice, what if, which one you like. And this is very important, in my opinion, because we find sometimes we have the heritage students in class and students, the Muslim students who... So you find that these students naturally lean toward the fusha forms, like you read. And there are the, some other students who would go in the other direction. Now, what's happening in class when we are doing an activity, it's so basically, so, waldak walidtak hum ayna yaskunun. And the other one say, oh, Baba and Mama, hinni saknin bi mantaet. Okay, so a student, what is happening here is that the students are able to communicate, and we have the coexistence of these two things. So it is a khalit, a mix, a tabuli of Arabic that is being produced in the class, as long as we accept it. So I am not going to change. I said, no, we don't say hum, we have to say hinni. Let them produce. Okay, it is going to be. We have to understand the same way when we teach the idafa and we teach, we teach the agreement, students will continue to make mistakes like andi sayyara kabir. Okay, it will take a year or two for them. The same thing about the mix. That mix will get refined. But in, in the way we look at the students in their production, it's much more natural. Just to give you anecdotally, I was in a first year after two weeks and the class was done in Egyptian. So the teacher asked me to go, and they were doing a, a find-out activity. So I went and I asked the student in Shami, although they were studying Ismak A, Winta second fin. So I asked the student, Shu Ismak, Ali Ismi John. I told him, Inta min min wain, mish minain min wain. I told him, I'm in Texas. That's after two weeks. I mean, he was able to, although I was using the, the Shami form, okay, because he was focused on Ismak. So Shu Ismak. Now, this brings the question about the writing. I mean, this is one big concern for uh, many of the teachers, is what will happen? To what extent are we going to accept the emergence of form like mish or beddi or aiz in writing? And what, in our experience, what we have seen that students in the first semester, naturally, they are going to be using many of these forms, like أنا ساكن في منطقة أنا بدي دجاج أنا بحب عندي حبيبة وأنا بحب حبيبتي بس ما عندي مصاري عندي مشكلة الله يسلمك uh, something, something like that the question is and, and my approach to this okay this is again the cyclical approach to this that the students will be able once they have more introduction and when we get to the second semester and the second years the students will be able to separate and they will understand that when we do the writing it is going to be in this more uh, literary uh, style that of, of fusha but what it requires us to do is to accept if a student writes ana mish mawjud that is okay, that's perfectly okay. We should not feel guilty because we feel guilty because what about Laysa? Those very students will learn Laysa and they will produce Laysa and they will put Laysa with its Arab when they get to third year. But in that, and what my argument is, and I have some samples, we don't have time to show these, and I say these samples that are written in and have uh, some dialect, if you show it to any native speaker of Arabic, and there are 300 uh, million, none of them won't understand what that student is trying to say. So again, focus on communication, have belief in the ability of the students that they will be able to produce appropriate language. But when we are in first year, uh, first semester, second semester, we have to accept because the fact of the matter that Arabs, when they write now, if we look at what Arabs are writing in the chat rooms and what they are writing in Muntadayat uh, al-Jazeera, even uh, some on the comments, they are, I mean, they are mixing. So why prevent, why not allow the students, why not allow the students to produce that, to have that freedom? But the most important thing is to believe that students will be able to go and refine and be able to produce language that is appropriate as long that, uh, that as long as they have our support and our encouragement and as long as we as teachers have a vision okay but remember focus on communication